So two things, which we all always start the, start the meeting with. But before that, let me wish everybody a happy 2024. And I think 2024 is going to unjam the enterprise blockchain space. We are going to have a hyperledger.nyc meetup uh, in person sometime uh, this year, April. Um, so in-person meetup uh, is going to start here again in New York City, the capital of world finance, as I like to call it. Uh, now the victor is clear, uh, especially after Brexit. Uh, the second point is that we want to be very inclusive here and uh, people can disagree with whatever is being said, but without being disagreeable, which is the most important thing. Be polite, uh, even when you're, uh, you know, dissenting or disagreeing. The third thing is that we follow the antitrust policies of the Hyperledger Foundation. Uh, so please uh, respect that wherever you are, because the antitrust policy law is different in different locales. And with that, I hand over this uh, call to Ashish. Of course, Ashish will answer questions towards the end and we can uh, uh, engage in discussion. Uh, I had already uh, talked with him about certain things and hopefully he'll address them. And that's that. Thank you, Ashish. Please take over. I thank you, Vipin. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks everyone. And thanks this uh, SIG for uh, giving us this opportunity. Of course, we had a discussion earlier as well. And thanks Vipin once again to invite me back over here to talk about the progress. So uh, the progress has been quite uh, multifold since then, and especially I'm here under the banner of Blue Finance, uh, which is essentially uh, something which we did. Uh, so as you already know, some of uh, some of us were there in that uh, in that SIG where we presented Word. So Word was our business under both the brand name, but Word was focused on. Uh, it, it is a private, world well, still is a private uh, uh, blockchain. And uh, Brew Finance is a DeFi layer on top of that private blockchain. So as Vipin was saying that 2024 is going to be the year where uh, enterprise blockchain is going to be uh, to emerge uh, a very, at a very strong footing. So we, we are seeing signs of that, though we believe that the way it may adopt may be different from how the progression has happened. So looking at that, that uh, world was moving towards traditional finance and decentralized finance uh, being two different streams. And uh, we saw that early um, last to last year, we saw that early um, early green shoots on how the convergence of these two may be happening or may, may be possible. So we saw JP Morgan coming and doing some transactions on Polygon network. We saw that uh, again, uh, product, uh, Project Guardian in, uh, uh, in, in the Singapore where a lot of banks have started working with some of the DeFi players. So looking at that, what we realized that uh, uh, there may be a uh, move towards uh, uh, towards uh, merger of these two different streams of traditional finance and decentralized finance. And in the last two years, of course, that has been proven quite right. So many participants have come who have brought uh, uh, who have brought traditional finance securities or many traditional finance institutions like JP Morgan, I mentioned, City, Nomura. Today, Nomura is actually just today we uh, came to know that Nomura is launching a L2 platform of its own using Polygon CDK. And then uh, Society General and others have been uh, tinkering with DeFi. 
So from that perspective, we started building a DeFi vertical of Whirl. So Whirl is essentially a commodity tokenization platform in the private blockchain space. We added a DeFi layer on top of that Brew Finance. So we kept the two separate brands. And today that makes us uh, uh, one of the few players who have actually at the production stage, we remain one, but um, there are others who are coming up with the same uh, philosophies with the same thesis. So, so as we all know that uh, tokenization, we have been, most of us who have worked in enterprise blockchain, uh, we have been talking about, we have been working on tokenization in last uh, several years. Mm -hmm. And uh, for last seven, eight years, people have worked on tokenization, whether asset tokenization, deposit tokenization, bond tokenization, et cetera. But the cool part about 2023 was rather that this was the year when instead of things moved out of pilot stages. So while pilots had been going on for so on, we started seeing real transaction volume taking place. So today, Onyx does a, around a couple of billions of dollars of transaction every day. Uh, a few uh, in the month of November, uh, JP Morgan said that they will be creating their own uh, L1 platform. And also we have seen that number of them have been moving towards L2. So this is the year in 2023 where we saw that actually tokenization came out of the shadows and finally started moving into the production stage on both traditional finance and DeFi stage. And it became the buzzword, even the likes of SWIFT. So SWIFT, uh, of course, everybody has been predicting this, but in 2023 market, uh, Citibank has started its own prediction, et cetera. And even the traditional finance giants like SWIFT, you all know about that. Uh, they started working with DeFi. So that has been the thesis we started working a couple of years back as well. Of course, our asset class was very much uh, specific. Like typically we have seen that when we talk about asset tokenization, uh, equity, uh, bonds, T-bills, they have been, and of course real estate have been at the forefront. Whirl and Brew had chosen at the other hand to work with commodities and mind you, not gold, but agriculture commodities. So essentially that is what uh, we have been doing. And we have been developing layers of, uh, uh, we have been building the entire stack and we have been building layers of that stack. So the first effort started with, of course, commodity tokenization, uh, wherein we adopted a policy of asset tokenization and the assets are stored in th with third party custodians. And then on top of that tokenized asset lend back lending, which we have, I mean, uh, Maybe very surprising to many, but uh, we have been doing tokenized asset back lending with TradFi banks in India for last more than two years, almost three years now. We just launched a couple of months back a tokenized commodity exchange. And when I'm saying commodity, these are all agri commodities. Uh, then we also launched a DeFi in last uh, in 2023 April, which is Blue Finance. And that is uh, the stack which we have built today. Now we are, of course, expanding it further. Uh, we are working on taking the solution to an import or export uh, using tokenization. And of course, which has been something, supply chain tokenization has been being under work for a lot of time. But our approach has been a bit different. Our approach has been to start with asset tokenization and build uh, slowly the stack on top of that. So that is something global commodity finance is what our uh, core focus will be. And of course, in that, a lot of infrastructure building is also required, which we have been doing or we will be doing over a period of time. For example, <clears throat> when we started working um, and we needed uh, Oracle data, we started working with IOTs. And what we realized is that the cost of IOT was quite high and we had to leave that path. But now, once again, uh, we are launching that under a deep, uh, deep in structure, means uh, decentralized uh, infrastructure on physical infrastructure on blockchain. So we will be adding that over a period of time as well. So this is the stack which we have been building for the commodity market. The first commodity stack was, of course, agriculture commodities. But uh, in future, 
other commodities will all also come over here. Excuse me, uh, Ashish, are you advancing the slides or is it still on the first slide? No, I'm advancing the slide. Oh, I don't see the slides advancing. Maybe there is something. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. Uh, oops, uh, that's that's a huge, a huge. Uh, oh, I, I went on slide number four in the, in this meanwhile. Okay. Uh, wait a second. Uh, it's, uh, uh, am I changing? Are we changing? Yes. Now? Yes. Okay, so let me just, uh, then uh, I will take 30 seconds. So this was the first slide we talked about that tokenization is finally moving out of the uh, out of the pilots and the POCs and come, has come actually in 2023, we saw that already happening. A lot of work happened on the mainnet levels, also onto the private blockchains. One more shift we saw happening and which in my opinion will be a bit, uh, it will be different from how we have seen that. So we saw enterprise blockchain, we saw public blockchain. But in my opinion, over a period of time, we will move towards a world where these two will be, and that is something even Beisu is doing with Hyperledger, mm -hmm. that perhaps we may have, may move towards a world where the transactions happen on specific uh, chains like uh, Apollo is saying L1s, or it may happen on L2, like Nomura is developing. And those will be supported by the security of a large L1, for example, uh, Ethereum or uh, Solana, instead of the previous model where we were enterprise blockchain and then we are adding DeFi. In my opinion, slowly the things will change. So that is one thing we have been seeing. Secondly, I was talking about this slide, what is happening in the tokenization market. Third, this was the slide I was talking about, that we have built a stack on the commodity uh, sector. So we started with tokenization as the base stack, added TradFi lending on top of that, added decentralized finance on top of that. And just uh, last to last month, we have also started a tokenized commodity trade platform or com tokenized commodity exchange, only for physical commodities, uh, no derivatives over here, so no securities. And of course, our idea is to take it to a global level. So this is where I was. And um, so the core idea when we, we started talking about tokenization of commodities was several, I mean, there were several factors which we saw that we can solve by, if we bring the uh, commodities on the, uh, the commodities on chain. And uh, I, I have uh, been into the commodity sector for like uh, more than, 10, 15 years, even before I started into blockchain, at least 10 years. So that experience uh, was why I chose commodities instead of equity or real estate. So the first thing is that commodity markets, especially the physical commodity markets are highly fragmented. And the reason being is that physical commodity markets, unlike pure financial assets, whether those are equities or crypto digital assets, require consumption, and but uh, plus they require logistics, they require of commodities from one part of the world to another part of the world. And that creates friction into the process, but also it creates very highly fragmented markets because there are a lot of intermediaries into the chain. So if we can remove few intermediaries, then of course we are in a position to remove some of the problems of fragmentation. And that was one aspect why we started working on commodities. And the second part is commodities markets have a, have a product called commodity finance, which is essentially inventory financing. So commodity cycles are in such a way that everybody in the supply chain ends up holding a lot and lot of commodities. It means your lot of money is locked into, uh, a lot of working capital is locked into that inventory. So commodity finance is a way to uh, way to solve that uh, inventory problem that uh, mm -hmm. liquidity is provided by giving loan against inventory. And that's a global product. Commodity finance is a $250 billion product across emerging markets, across European markets. Anywhere you see commodities, you will see commodity finance. But what we have seen, and we have seen uh, in many markets, that this market is prone to high level of frauds. 
whether those frauds happen in India, China, uh, Southeast Asia, Singapore, these are some of the examples, Latin America, means almost at every point, every bank of the globe has suffered in commodity finance. And as a result, many banks actually have pulled out of this and hedge funds are currently the real um, players into this market. So that was second main thing that how do I we create a commodity finance market, which is less fraud prone because the fraud was largely double spend problem, multiple link at, I mean, all these, whether you see NSEL, Chindao, Hinlong, all of these are about multiple lending against the same collateral. Only Access World fraud was different in the sense that Access World is a Glencore subsidiary. Glencore is a well-known name in, uh, in the commodity markets. So in physical commodities and Access World was just a duplicate fraud, a duplication of uh, deposit receipts. But other than that, mostly it has been about uh, multiple lending. So we thought that blockchain will be able to solve that. So we created a product that goods, I mean, the product was already there. Goods are stored in bonded warehouses, inventory is stored in bonded warehouses. Loan is given against that. We brought that on chain. So we brought the commodity on chain and we brought the commodity finance on chain. So that was the core idea. How do you reduce fragmentation? And secondly, how do you reduce frauds? Today, uh, uh, we are one of the, uh, large uh, blockchain platforms in asset tokenization space. Of course, in India, we are number one. Uh, we have already tokenized approximately, six, this number has gone to almost $700 million now. Uh, in terms of asset tokenization, uh, we have a network of 1,500 custodian warehouses. We have already served, and I'm talking about retail customers here, approximately 20,000 participants, uh, starting from the level of farmers to the level of intermediary traders to also processing mills and commodity processing mills and so on. And we are working, one of the few institutions across the globe to work with traditional finance institutions on asset tokenized asset lending. So we are working with few of the names in India. Uh, we are also working with the government sector and that has been going on over there. So this was our journey started on the private blockchain under the umbrella of, and it is still going on under the umbrella of brand name of uh, world. We added Brew Finance on top of that. And when we added Brew Finance on top of that, what it did that, it allows the liquidity to flow in either from traditional finance banks or from a decentralized finance protocol, depending upon where the liquidity is cheaper. So two years back, DeFi was, cheaper and traditional finance uh, was uh, actually costly. And now, traditional finance in India is cheaper, actually speaking, after the rate hike in, uh, in the US market. So how, how the system works, very simple. These are commodity owners. They can be like very small farmers. We have given loans of less than $100 as well to farmers. Mm -hmm. And they can be large, um, traders as well, they can be institutional traders as well, or they can be institutional mills as well. They have commodity as inventory. They brought, they bring this inventory to a bonded warehouse. Why bonded warehouse means this is a third party warehouse. This is not in control of the borrower. These are the warehouses on our blockchain network and there uh, the goods are deposited. They are verified verified both using technology. So we have brought, as I said, we started building with IoT, but uh, we have machine learning solutions deployed here. Plus there is a physical verification agency as well. And the price of the commodity is determined using price oracles. So based on all this data, we create commodity non-fungible tokens, which go into the, uh, which go onto the platform. And then that can be used as a collateral against which both our traditional finance banks or the DeFi lenders, both of them can lend. DeFi allows us access to the global market. TradFi allows us access to the regulated Indian market. But of course, this same model can be taken to any part of the world. And the same model can be used for uh, purpose of lending by people across the globe as well. 
uh, this is tech architecture essentially the same thing shown in a different language because the part is about tradfi and defi so how we have done that so the the one which you see on the left hand side uh, this side this is our private blockchain which we have created on quorum uh, so uh, quorum was our choice at that point of time uh, so these are the same borrowers or depositors they bring their goods to the assets uh, custodians there are banks there are asset verification agencies all of them write data on our private blockchain that is where the permission blockchain that is where the assets are essentially tokenized and created as an if these are banks as a lender then the entire transaction gets closed over here there is nothing which goes on to the public blockchain but if defi is a lender means someone is lending from a defi protocol so the we have created a bridge between the permission blockchain and our uh, we are here on uh, polygon so on the poly between polygon and uh, the permission blockchain we have created a bridge uh, we have created a bridge the bridge sends nfts or the collateral to the polygon network and takes the liquidity from polygon network to the uh, to be given back to the borrowers onto the chain so for the interface level we have interface over here typically web back uh, web applications also a mobile application and here it's a pure uh, mobile based interface but whatever with the interface at the end of the day uh, the core idea is that the assets are minted on a uh, on a permission blockchain and later on if there is need of defi intervention then they move towards the defi uh, this is the same thing which uh, we did essentially we have already talked about um, so so what i will do uh, sorry and the core idea here was so so of course there are other defi products uh, pro protocols who are doing uh, who are doing um, rwa financing how we differentiated ourselves over here is that typically all the defi protocols require a fintech they work with fintechs but they work with third party and thereby the benefits of decentralization actually stops working so for example a defi protocol will give loan because when they are doing rwa not when they are doing this to less play but if they are doing rwa they will give loan to a fintech say for example in indonesia the fintech will acquire customers will give loan over there and take the money back from the borrowers as part of collection and pass it back to the defi protocol on our platform at the other hand there is no third party in between as you saw that everything is i mean of course there are players but all of them are connected through smart contract so the money doesn't goes to world or money doesn't goes to a third party fintech everything remains on chain each part of the transaction remains on chain so the borrower directly dips into the pool and takes money from there by providing their assets so there is no third party coming in between so end to end integration has brought that benefit and that means that uh, we have been able to also create some sort of social impact over here so i will take a pause over here and if there are questions i can answer that now or i can um, uh, if there are specific areas which on which you would like me to focus i can bring those area, uh, i can bring that into discussion away don't hesitate guys please uh, ask questions of course it has to be jim first <laughs> right thanks vipin so yeah the, my big thing on the defi and the traditional banks is they usually have very very different rules and regulations that they have to comply with so my guess is and this i need your help to understand it better but i'm guessing your platform has to accommodate those differences in regulations in a sense so if if i'm borrowing money if it's coming from one of the DeFi things, I have a different set of, I assume, rules and regulations that are going to apply versus me borrowing from some commercial bank or the equivalent of that in India. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. So actually speaking, uh, 
uh, DeFi regulations are yet to be framed in many parts of the world, right? Even the USA uh, has not regulations and is rather saying that the existing regulations apply. And in some countries like Japan, Singapore, et cetera, have already created a framework. India is one of the countries which has decided that they will only go for regulating the assets, except for a few things, um, only after G20 adopts the regulations. So that way, uh, we have no regulation. We have a regulatory arbitrage over here. But you are pretty much right, Jim, that uh, when it is a bank lending, we have to comply with every regulation related to the banking sector. And that's how we build the solution. That is why the initial solution was built on permission blockchain. It used Quorum, where private transactions was possible. I mean, uh, that was before Hyperledger uh, brought private transactions. And um, we built it from the solution from that perspective. So as of today, we, we are in a position to follow the regulations related to banking sector, even if we are into the DeFi, because the core was built using those regulations in mind. All right. So then the other thing that in the U.S., okay. if we were doing the same thing you're doing and had to comply with regulations, one of the challenges here, and I don't know if it, it matters in India or not, don't know, is here, if I were, uh, I'll call it operating in this network as a, a participant and I wanted to borrow money for whatever I'm selling or buying in, in this uh, ecosystem, if I'm doing that in the U.S., the banks that I would be borrowing, getting my loan from, would be required to support um, AML sanctions uh, real time on me. So if I'm a legitimate borrower last year, and all of a sudden the federal government now puts a sanction on me as of today, the bank has to say, oh, I can't give you any more money, among other things that they'd have to take as an action because the sanctions are real time. Do you have to deal with sanctions at all? So India now applies uh, AIML regulations on any crypto participant, uh, including exchanges, including DeFi protocols. So we have to follow that as well. All right. So every participant, in, 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 even the DeFi yeah. side, then is is a known entity legally to you, which is yes, good. exactly. We 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 don't work without KYCs. Right. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah, it's not pure DeFi in the sense that it's not an anonymous. Uh, it's not censorship resistant, but the core idea of DeFi for us is that how do we pull global liquidity into a global south? Yeah. So for example, if Jim wants to give loan to a farmer in India, he can use our protocol to do that using stable coins. Excellent. Money. Money. Yeah. Uh, hey, Ashish, uh, great presentation. Um, can you, I, I missed the part about the cash movement. How does this cash work? Uh, through the system, um, both on your uh, private network as well as when you work with your uh, your DeFi side? So that's where the problem area is, uh, still is. And um, uh, so so where that is where one part remains. It is still remains on traditional financial uh, side. So how we do that, just uh, allow me a second. So, so if the cash movement, if it is a banking transaction, okay. So as we saw that the banking transaction happens entirely on the permission blockchain. But one part which is not on the blockchain as of today is cash movement. Uh, because uh, we have to use fiat for this purpose. So, so what we have done that we have connected our platform to the bank's uh, core banking system. And as soon as there is a cash movement that gets registered uh, onto the blockchain, but real cash movement in the TradFi lending doesn't happen onto the blockchain. So we actually speaking, India has launched a CBDC. Uh, we participated and we went to the finals. We did not win the finals by the way, with the same proposition that Indian CBDC should be used on our protocol for lending to farmers whereby we replace the fiat currency and we bring the CBDC so that this entire transactions happens on blockchain. So, so that is one part which is still remains as of outside of the blockchain. But once the CBDC comes and once some of the banks we are working with are permitted to use CBDC for that purpose, we will be able to use that. Coming to the DeFi side. So on the DeFi side, we use on-ramp, off-ramp solutions. 
how the cash movement happens on the DeFi side. So on DeFi, you have two players. Uh, one is the borrower and one is this liquidity provider. So say for example, Jim sitting in the US and here a farmer in India. So how it happens that uh, the liquidity provider provide a stable coin liquidity into the brew pool. And in the brew pool, when they provide liquidity, the stable coins come into brew pool. We convert that stable coins into, first of all, we convert them into dollar. And then we convert that dollar into uh, Indian rupee and give Indian rupee to the borrowers. Of course, we have that uh, exposure as well. When the money is returned, because we, we give only six months loan, we don't give high uh, duration loans. So after six months, when the money is returned, that, uh, uh, that fiat currency we receive back from the borrowers, we convert that into stable coins and we send it back to the liquidity providers. I hope uh, I was able to make it clear. Yeah, yeah, that's great, thanks. Sure, thank you, Manik. By the way, uh, if anybody goes back in history to the development of the Federal Reserve and uh, the subsidiaries, you can say that it was due to the seasonal nature of agricultural commodities in, in America. Back in 19th century, America was a very powerful agricultural nation. Well, it still is. Uh, but the financing uh, ebb and flow is what created the Federal Reserve. So financing of agricultural commodities is a basic feature of finance. In fact, it might even be the foundational feature of how money and finance started. So in a sense, you are striking at the base of the system. Uh, I have one question for you, which is, I noticed that you are on a two to 4%, um, um, you know, um, fee. Uh, fee. Fee structure is two to 4%, but others are uh, 0 0.4 and 0 0.5, only because, are they only because they are only dealing with a part of the system? Or, you know, how do you, justify, because there is a lot of uh, uh, focus being given to the fee structures, especially, for example, in the Bitcoin ETF uh, coming up. Um, and uh, could you comment on that? Sure. So, Vipin, there are two parts. Uh, when I say 2 to 4%, actually speaking, we are still cheaper than others, because when you have a fintech in between, that fintech takes 10%. So while the DeFi protocol only earns this 0.4.5%, the FinTech which is working in between, which is taking money from here, keeps a spread of approximately eight to 10%. Happens in India as well. In India, FinTechs borrow at 15 and lend at around 24 to 30%. We, at the other hand, the total cost starting from end to end is two to 4%. So it means that we have been actually able to cut it down significantly and still keeping that on our books. So in case of other DeFi protocol, it gets divided between the books of the DeFi versus books of the FinTech. Here it accrues on our platform. Second part, the on-ramp, off-ramp solution itself takes away approximately 1.5 to 2% out of this business. So, so as a result, we are not actually, um, we are not actually uh, I would say that uh, enriching ourselves uh, a lot uh, by exploiting the borrowers. We have actually reduced the fee significantly into the ecosystem. Today, I rate the lay, rate of lending for me in India to the farmer segment is 9% per annum. That is just 1% above the mortgage rate in the USA. Um, so, so we have been actually able to, and that is, Actually speaking, microfinance in India is in the range of approximately 24 to 26%. We are at 9%. So we have been able to reduce the cost using this entire structure. D despite the fact that a lot of that money accrues on our platform, significant portion also goes towards the cost, but it accrues on the platform. So that's the benefit that our revenue goes up comparatively. 
said that we have cut down the cost of lending for the borrowers by 50% to 70% as compared to microfinance or even traditional uh, lending ecosystems. Uh, the only reason I brought it up was because it gives a, uh, this particular no, I, slide I agree. gives a, actually, actually gives this a slide, wrong, uh, wrong in, 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 impression. No, actually, I this, mean, this, this slide was not meant to be here. This is, uh, this unfortunately I opened a deck which is an investor deck or not a product deck. So that's okay. that's where this uh, this came up, yeah. Um, okay, uh, you know, there are those other questions which I had posed to you, which we will go into, especially uh, now, one of the things is the volatility, meaning when you're um, maintaining your treasury in multiple uh, types of instruments, let us say Ethereum, uh, let us say, uh, yeah, Indian rupee, dollars, uh, the volatility of each one of these moving independently of each other would also um, affect your treasury, so to say. So the treasury management becomes a very uh, uh, important part of this exercise. Uh, I wonder what, whether you could comment on that at all. Sure, Vipin, I fully agree with you. So as a result, what happens is that we only deal in two currencies. Uh, we deal in, I mean, uh, we deal in stable coins, dollar backed. So only USD. And secondly, right now at the native, I mean, the native currency, which is India, if we go outside of India, there will be another native currency. So we are very much, uh, because uh, when I jumped into commodity markets at the same time, simultaneously, I came into currency markets. Um, and uh, have been working into currency and I I was in 2008 when currencies went like uh, especially emerging currencies went haywire. Uh, some of you would be there in uh, during the 97 crisis as well. I was still in college then. But um, uh, what I'm trying to say that we have been very much focused. We don't uh, take the liquidity in uh, terms of uh, digital assets means no Bitcoin, Ethereum, nothing like that. Only stable coins that allows us to manage the volatility comparatively between only one currency pair, which is USD INR. When we go to other countries, it will be USD maybe sales. If we go to Indonesia, it will be USD rupiah and so on. So, so that is where our focus will be. How do we manage the currency risk only for one pair of the currency instead of having so many pairs? Thank and you. second part is that uh, we hedge uh, the entire exposure. So that is uh, because we are dealing with small borrowers who typically don't have any idea how the hedging happens. And secondly, they, many of them don't know that the liquidity is coming from a dollar pool. So for them, it's the converted INR. So they don't even know that they have to hedge that. So we take the hedging position on their behalf. So treasury management is certainly very important for us and we are focusing upon it. And that's why we have kept the exposure highly reduced at this moment. Thank you. Anybody else, any questions? I, I, I had just a, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. a quick operational question. I think you can answer pretty fast on that screen uh, that's up right now on the architecture. So uh, if I'm a liquid liquidity provider, um, there's this web mobile app. Are wallets involved? Is there a hot or cold wallet involved to transfer from fiat to uh, the crypto? Yeah, so there is a wallet. So, okay. uh, so if you are a crypto, so we have created it for both crypto natives and non crypto natives. If you are a non crypto native, you can, but that that is only for Indian uh, Indian people. They can give us INR directly, and so we accept INR here in India as well. Otherwise, if you are from outside of India, you will have to give us a stable coin through your wallet. Ah, okay. So Great, the moment thanks. you open the mobile app or you open the web app, it will first thing it will ask you is to connect your wallet. Okay. Even, even because what we ha also happens, we also give, because these are uh, hundred per, rather uh, over collateralized loans. So we also give the collateral, we also bring the collateral charge creation in the name of the same wallet. And also we transfer the interest in the same wallet. So wallet connection is required for that, all that purpose. Okay. okay. Because a part of yield also comes in blue tokens. So, so for example, if uh, 
we have to provide yield today. So it will be approximately say 8% on dollars, fiat yield plus 10% blue token yield. That is where the DeFi benefits start coming in, that the yield is not coming from the lending activity, but the yield is also coming from being part of the ecosystem and uh, in the form of a token as well. And where is Brew traded? Uh, Brew is not yet listed, but we are uh, working on listing it by month of April. So but right now there is a private market for Brew Finance uh, tokens, but uh, not yet publicly listed. Money. Uh, yeah. You... Yeah. Hi, just maybe maybe we were to take it offline. A bit more technical question about the uh, about the whole core of infrastructure. Maybe can I reach out to you later? Sure, uh, money anytime. Yeah. Uh, maybe if you can share with me your email, I'll, I'll reach out to you. Yeah. Yeah. So I, at this time, I have to also say that money uh, is going to make another presentation here, where he is going to link uh, the entire. Uh, you know his his thought processes are a system uh, oriented, and so he his product uh, is going to link both the payment side into the picture, and also when you're talking about uh, other financial like equities and other things, then you need uh, some kind of uh, you know clearing exchanges, a lot of financial market infrastructure, which is uh, actually being worked on today by uh, people like LSEG and the Euroclear uh, people. And mostly on, I mean, some of them are on Corda, some of them are uh, on other uh, other uh, blockchains. But uh, anyway. Yeah, we, we just wanted to want to clarify. I mean, the focus will be on on more on on privacy, uh, mm -hmm. uh, privacy on the chains so using zero knowledge proofs, and how we are implementing for enter enterprise ledgers. It's just as a first of its kind. So, yes, because that's uh, essential for all implementing all of these correct uh, things like order books or any kind of uh, any, cap tables any yeah. you, you payment payment versus payment you, yeah you, you need privacy and that's fundamentally to, we, we yeah. are solving yeah so even if you are focusing on that that is in uh, uh, in pursuit of creating the global infrastructure for uh, you know trading of what we we can call it RWA for for lack of a better term, but they are all different kinds of <laughs> RWA. Yeah. Uh, 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 you know, you know, there are dematerialized RWA like shares and stocks, and there are actual physical RWA like commodities and real estate. So uh, when we have this veil of um, the market laid over the whole thing, then uh, we have more interoperation between all of these commodity types and payment types. Anyway, go ahead, uh, Ashish. Sorry to hold forth on certain things. No, that, that's a great idea. So, I mean, the thought process, as uh, Mani mentioned, that uh, privacy using zero knowledge proof and all. Because uh, if we want traditional finance to come on to or if we want a merger of traditional finance and DeFi finance, uh, then certainly we will require these services. We will require, uh, and as we are seeing that the ETF is coming up and people are saying, hey, it is all against decentralization that you require custodian and all, but without that, we are not going to move anywhere. So those things will be certainly required and people are building that. And I would love to discuss money how, because I have certain, my own thought process on uh, should we build uh, something on those lines? So would you refer to this also uh, as a supply chain trade finance solution? Would you? Over a period of time, in... yes. Over a period of time, that's that's what we are actually taking a solution to. That uh, our focus market is uh, commodities. So whatever happens in the commodity business, we would like to be part of that over a period of time. So right now what we are doing is inventory finance.
thing. We are providing the inventory. We are taking the inventory in the warehouses, uh, bonded warehouses, giving loan against that. But that's a very pawn market sort of a structure. And then we have just started the tokenized commodity exchange. So the third step, which is coming up, is of course the supply chain finance. And over a period of time, of course, the idea is that how do we use tokenized tokens transfer as a as a tool of import export. And if we are doing that, how do we bring import export supply chain financing? So all that is part of a evolving stack for us. So if you have more uh, material, otherwise we can uh, continue this discussion or you can uh, go ahead and do okay, your thing. So I will I will then maybe, I mean, that, that discussion was there, but maybe I will just take this slide, small one. And uh, the core idea of why we use blockchain was this one, that how do we, how do we solve the multiple lending or uh, other type of fraud problems for this. Also, one question always happens that, what about the commodity, physical controls? Because you are saying that, hey, you know, I have these assets and uh, these assets are uh, in the control of the warehouse. How do we ensure that? So, so for that, we have certainly built certain machine learning solutions. We have pulled data from uh, many places. We are also working with one of the largest warehousing. Uh, we are in the process of working. It is all uh, will take a lot of time, but the largest, a uh, lot of time in the terms of uh, procurement process of the government. But largely, uh, we will be working in a such a fa fashion that how do we use uh, uh, intelligent uh, machines to have a uh, to have a control on the movement and also notification of the movement of the goods. So we are working on that um, uh, pilot is going on and hopefully in next few months it will convert into a full place large project. So that that's because physical thing remains a challenge, uh, especially in commodity space. Also given that in India, especially or in other parts of the world also, uh, in some parts of the world, like in the US you have a storage in large silos. So the value stored in a particular silo is very high and you can deploy a lot of uh, costly technology solutions. But here in India, we do storage in a 50 kg bag. A 50 kg bag of wheat is approximately $20. Uh, how do you put something in uh, that $20 bag and how do you monitor that? So that remains a challenge. We will be solve, working on solving that. And the second part was that we have been able to reduce the cost we have been able to create a centralized lending process for the lenders and so on. So that is where we use technology to solve some of the problems. And some of the problems are being tried to be solved over a period of time. We are seeing that a deep in infrastructure network of IoT solutions, intelligent cameras and so on to come over here. And we will also see that uh, you know, we, we are also planning as I discussed earlier that how do we merge all of that over a global trade platform? So, so that's all I believe for me to say, but I would love to have further discussion if there are any questions on that or any specific part which the people would like me to talk about. One of the things that comes up is uh, whether, um, you know, what to, what to do about default, uh, that's one. The second is what is to be done about deterioration of physical commodity. Uh, that is, you know, what happens if the rain or, you know, any kind of insects or rodents attack the product. The third, of course, is that you are obviously not going to uh, uh, lend against uh, commodities that are extremely fragile or extremely volatile. Uh, so those are the three things regarding that, uh, including uh, you know, liquidation in terms of default would, would be great to talk about that, those. Do 
Did he disappear? Looks like he did. Ashish uh, dropped off. Are you guys hearing what uh, Ashish is saying or Jeff? No, saying? he. I don't see him either. No, he he's, does look like he's gone as a participant. He's gone. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> so well, now, maybe... I, I, Vipin, you can pick it up from here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, these are the questions that I asked him to address. Oh, here because... he comes again. He's coming back in. Oh, beautiful. I am so sorry. I just got uh, disconnected for a couple of minutes. Yes. So the question uh, arose, uh, I mean, I, I asked uh, three specific questions dealing with the physical um, uh, commodities. One is default. Second is, you know, um, decay or destruction of the commodity due to improper storage or due to, you know, some extreme events. Third is, of course, the uh, the how things are getting liquidated. Okay, it, so see, yeah, so I can take one by one. So in case of default, default and liquidation will be interlinked, right? So so what happens in case of a default that uh, if it is uh, of course stratify bank, we don't need to worry much about how do we uh, how do we um, work on the default because it's when the DeFi is there then we take care of the default process and the liquidation process on behalf of the uh, liquidity providers. So that's one intervention we have to do. However, the good part about uh, this uh, asset class is commodity is highly liquid asset class. So it's not real estate. So you have an asset class which is highly liquid, which can be sold in almost any part of the world. It means, of course, you can sell online we have our own uh, trade platform where it can be sold. But even if it is to be sold physically, we can even sell it in a small village or maybe rural markets, a small, a small urban centers as well. So we um, actually speaking in last uh, two and a half years of giving loan, we have zero default. We have zero case of liquidation. Of course, uh, the track, track record will not be maintained forever. But we, we are ready for that eventuality. Actually speaking, that was the core idea of providing the exchange as well. That one idea of exchange is by trading, people are essentially selling goods and we are recovering our loan and the interest from that sale proceeds itself. So that helps us in collection and we can use any day to sell online that commodity. Secondly, we can sell offline as well. So those parts are there. We have physical infrastructure, warehouses are there, which are manned by people. And those people are actually in a position to sell it in the market as well. Coming to maintenance. So in maintenance terms, there are several aspects. One, each and every penny of the commodity on our platform is insured. So actually speaking, because we work with a lot of government sector, Total insurance at any given point of time on our platform because of the government's own insurance policies and all. Uh, I mean, last uh, few months back, it was approximately, uh, uh, it was approximately, I would say that um, 100 million, um, yeah, approximately, sorry, a, a billion dollars uh, because uh, they have a stock which is, uh, which is tokenized but they also have other government stock and they have to take insurance for that. So approximately less than a billion dollars, but approximately $900 million of insurance was there approximately six months back. So every penny is insured, that's one, against any sort of physical problems that may happen. Plus any sort of employee fiduciary fraud is also covered in those insurance policies. The third part is maintenance. How do we ensure? Because Insurance will not cover poor maintenance. So for that process, what we, we do that uh, the, uh, the maintenance records. So there is a 15 days, every 15 days, there is a fumigation process. And there, there are other processes in the warehouses which are to be carried out. 
So again, those records of those processes have been carried out or not, it's also available on the blockchain itself. So for every warehouse, when they do those activities, they put a record here on the blockchain and uh, that is available for verification by the lender as well. Sounds great. Um, I, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Uh, so if anybody else has any last questions, now is the time to ask, or you can contact Ashish on his uh, email. And uh, thank you, Ashish, for showing up and being so forthcoming about all your, your platform. And I think this is the place where RWA will start with a physical foundation. Yeah, great, great solution, well thought out, and you know, want to see more of this as it evolves. And it, you, you are starting at the right place. So I think, in a sense, the roadmap you have forward sort of makes a lot of sense logically. At a point, you'll in, integrate other standards and so on as you hit what I call different areas of what I call supply chain. But for now, you've really had a very, very solid start, well thought out. So thank you for that. Thanks, thanks a lot, Jeff. So Vipin, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks everyone for uh, listening so patiently and joining us, uh, especially quite early morning in uh, some parts of the world. And thanks um, uh, the Hyperledger Foundation for giving us this stage. We would love to talk about RWA in future and hopefully whenever you are doing the physical event, uh, Vipin, I will be there in New York to attend that. Yes, uh, we are going to have it uh, probably in April sometime, we don't know, uh, but it's going to be run by um, Jamil, who has got one of the, Jamil Sheikh, he's got one of the biggest uh, networks uh, of, of people. Uh, I think his Hyperledger meetup has got 40,000 people. So we are talking about numbers that, you know, that are beyond what we are capable of uh, in uh, Hyperledger, you know, in, in Hyperledger. But it's going to be physical uh, and he is planning a multi-day event or even a single day event. Um, and hopefully some of these um, products will feature in that. Thanks a lot. And goodbye. and. Good night. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Looking for, uh, hopefully, we will uh, connect soon, Vipin. See you. Bye bye. Bye.